Hey guys, welcome to the first of two videos on language analysis, which is the biggest money maker out of language form and structure analysis. Simply put, we'll be spending these two videos looking at the ways in which language can shape meaning. As a neat way for you to remember what to look out for, I've devised a way of splitting the different ways in which language shapes meaning into three separate levels, each of which has two parts to consider. In this video, we'll cover literal meanings and figurative meanings. And then in the next video, we'll cover related meanings before concluding with some practical tips. Not only that, but as we progress, we'll apply what we learn to a short extract from Hansel and Gretel by Anne Sexton, a poem which retells the Brothers Grimm's story, Hansel and Gretel. This way, we'll be able to see what we learn in this language analysis section being put into practice. So by the end, you should have a clear understanding of numerous ways in which language can be used to shape meaning, giving you plenty to look out for in your language analysis. So here's the extract I mentioned, which describes the witch's famous death in the oven. The witch turned as red as the Jap flag. Her blood began to boil up like Coca-Cola. Her eyes began to melt. She was done for. Altogether, a memorable incident. Ooh, fizzy. First and most simply, let's talk about literal meanings. If I say something literally, I use words in their most basic or usual way. Literally speaking, our passage here is describing the moment the witch burns to death in the oven. But what else can we say about that? There's not a huge amount of room for analysing literal meanings, but there is some. Let's talk about connotations and then tone. So, connotations. When considering literal language, we can always think about the fact that different literal words can connote different things. Connotations are the opposite of denotations. A connotation implies something, while a denotation says it outright. Let's look at the connotations of the words in that closing comment on the witch's death. She was done for, altogether a memorable incident. Now, there are lots of ways of reflecting on someone's death in poetry, and most of them don't look like this. Take this line from Adonais by Percy by Shelley, which lyrically comments on fellow rock star poet John Keats's death. He has outsoared the shadow of our night. I don't know about you, but I know which one I'd rather have on my grave. The phrase done for in Sexton's poem has really informal and chatty connotations. And it's odd that Sexton tries to sum up the violent murder of the witch quickly and dispassionately by saying, altogether, a memorable incident. If Sexton would have used words like unforgettable, significant, or momentous, then the connotations would seem way more epic. But Sexton clearly chooses a rather dull word, memorable, to suggest the death is actually not that memorable. In other words, the connotations of her words shape her meaning. And we got there. Now let's quickly talk about tone. Here's the link between connotations and tone. Connotative words are important as they help to establish an author's or character's tone, meaning their overall attitude or mood. In our extract, the connotations of words like done for and memorable make Sexton's tone sound chatty but dispassionate, ironic and detached. You can often learn a lot from tone. It might tell you about an author's attitude towards something, it might tell you about a character's personality, or it might tell you about a character's attitude towards something. As they say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So basically, we should be thinking about how connotations can shape tone, and therefore meaning in a text. Both will be really important in shaping the author's or a character's attitude towards something which will then help us understand what an author is trying to say in a text. In our example, Sexton uses colloquial language to create an ironic and disinterested tone. But we don't really know why yet. Literal language is important, but all the real fun is found in figurative language. 
Figurative language is the opposite of literal language. Figurative language uses non-literal techniques like metaphors, personification, similes, rhymes, alliteration, and many, many others to make or emphasize points. Most literary language techniques are figurative techniques, so this is where the money is. Let's look at two very broad types of figurative language, comparative language and musical language. A lot of textbook figurative language is what we might call comparative language. For instance, metaphors, similes, personification, allegories, metonymies, and synecdoches all compare one thing to another to create meaning. Comparing things is always useful for authors as it allows them to enrich the thing they're trying to describe through reference to something else. In our extract, there are two interesting similes to look at. So what's going on? Well, first of all, Sexton's comparing the witch's burning colour to a Jap flag. Japanese flags have a red circle in the middle, so that makes sense. She's just emphasising the redness. Second, she says her blood boils up like Coca-Cola. That could refer to two things. First, it could be a reference to Coke shooting up when it's fizzy. And second, it could actually be a reference to boiling the water out of Coke, which leaves behind a pretty grim-looking residue of black syrup. Either way, it's a pretty vivid and gross simile, and it's odd to compare something as sweet and sugary as Coke to blood. So, once again, comparative language adds colour to or extends meanings. In this case, referring to a Japanese flag allowed Sexton to emphasise the flame's vivid redness, and referring to Coca-Cola allowed her to create a super vivid, disturbing and slightly too delicious image of boiling blood. Next up is what I'm calling musical language, which is a little more tricky. So in addition to comparative language, we need to consider the heaps of techniques that relate to the sound of words, such as alliteration, assonance, consonance, repetition, rhyme, and rhythm. These techniques don't compare things like comparative language does, but they still all shape meaning in non-literal ways. It's normally pretty hard to say what rhymes, rhythm, or repetition mean, but there is normally something to say. For instance, a perfect rhyme might give a sense of closure. Jagged rhythms might mirror an unsettled state of mind, or repetition might emphasise the importance of something. Let's see how musical language shapes meaning in our extract. First up, we've got the alliteration in the words, blood began to boil. This is pretty straightforward. All you need to see is that those repeated B sounds really emphasise that graphic image of boiling blood. Second, we also have some interesting repetition. The words her and began are repeated in two consecutive descriptions of the witch's death. Our question once again is, what's the effect and meaning of these repetitions? Well, by repeating the same structure of phrase, Sexton makes the poem sound deliberately half-hearted, as if she's being lazy in her word choice, which suits the ironic and disinterested tone we discussed earlier. It also makes it sound like she's rather tediously listing details. So there we go, two slightly more subtle ways in which the sounds of the sentence shape meaning. To analyse musical language like this, you might need to be a bit creative, as the ways in which it shapes meaning are often quite subtle, but as we've just seen, they will be there. Right, that's it for this first of two videos on language analysis. In this video, we looked at literal meanings and figurative meanings, and we saw that with literal language, connotative words shape tone, which helps us understand what an author is trying to say in a text. And with figurative language, comparative language and musical language can create more subtle meanings through referring to other things or using sound to create an effect, respectively. In the next video, we'll look at the last of the three main ways in which language shapes meaning related meanings. And then we'll tie it all together with some general advice to implement in your HSC responses. So whenever you're ready, I'll see you there.